Hi, uh, I, I'm Andy Mackay. I work at Mozilla. And I have a terrible problem when it comes to submitting talks because I'm always at the very last minute. And I submitted this talk, and I realized when I did it that I wasn't actually stating in my talk who should be paranoid in this. Should the developer be paranoid? Should the person submitting a payment be paranoid? And, and the answer to this is everyone should be paranoid. If you're ever going anywhere near payments, uh, real money, you should be paranoid. So this talk is primarily focusing on how we at Mozilla are paranoid. Um, so as you know, Mozilla makes Firefox, web browser. Um, we've never actually done anything like this, like actually taking real money. Uh, we just get lots of money from other people like Google instead. But uh, taking real money from real people all the time is something new. Um, so I'm working on Firefox OS. I've got a spiffy t-shirt. Um, so Firefox OS is a new phone. Here it is. Woo! Uh, anyone, else? We got what? anyone else got a phone, Firefox OS phone? We've got one there. Tarek's got one. There we go. All right. If you want to come and fondle my phone, please do so later. That's fine. Um, how exciting is the Firefox OS phone? Well, here's a picture of Stephen Holden taking a picture with his phone of a Firefox OS phone, which was taking a picture when I was taking a picture. And he thought it was pretty exciting, so I think you should too. Um, so I'm working on the marketplace. Um, and I say to everyone, I'm working on the marketplace. And I say, what's that? And I say, it's an app store. And they go, OK. Um, why we didn't call it the App Store, I don't know. Perhaps someone has patented that. Oh, whatever. Um, so it's the marketplace. You go to your phone, you buy an app. Um, it's Django powered, and it takes money. So as a developer, you will want to be writing apps for the phone that require payments before you install or accept a payment as you go along. So we call those uh, basically paid apps and in-app payments. And in-app payments are when you sort of you're playing your game and you want to get the magical sword or you want to get to the next level or something like that. So that's an in-app payment. Um, so here's a quick demo of actually doing a payment. And this was pre-recorded because you know, it's never going to work in real life. Um, you know, the demo gods are not with me. But here you can see, here's the App Store. Um, I click on the thing, and then it's going to fire up this thing. This is on a staging server. And it was from, we actually did this test in Spain, so it was a little slow. But then the payment's going to go through. And you'll see in a second, this is going to be the confirmation screen there. It's gone. Um, and that is going to go straight to carrier billing. So it's going to appear on your phone bill. Um, so we're not actually taking the credit card. We're not doing PayPal or anything like that. And there we go. And then we install the app. Um, An HTML5 video tag. Awesome. So that's how the, the payment flow actually works. And everything I'm talking about here is completely open source. All the payment flow, all the sites, everything we do is open source. Uh, the main project is called uh, Zamboni. Um, everything's on GitHub, including this presentation. So if you want to come and uh, go through these links later on, just go to GitHub. Um, and there are two ways to sort of make money out of, well, there's multiple ways to make money out of the App Store. One is to sell a, make a good app and sell it. Two is to hack our payment system and steal lots of money off people. I don't recommend that approach. The approach I do recommend is that we have a security bug bounty, which is paid out somewhere in the order of about uh, $300,000 so far to people who find any bugs in Firefox or across our websites. So if you do find any serious security bugs across our websites, please don't tell everybody. File a bug, and we will pay you. So there is a bug bounty. Go and find bugs. And they all come out of my salary, so it kind of sucks when you do that. So we've actually been processing payments for a long time. So we have a, I work on a site as well called Add-ons, which is where you go and get your cool add-ons for Firefox. And I've talked about this at a couple of Django cons. So here is the page for the best site, Adblock Plus. Love Adblock Plus. And you can go onto Adblock Plus's page and click a Contribute button and then make a contribution, which goes to the Adblock Plus developer. Uh, you can you know, choose whatever your contribution is and make that. Um, it, goes through PayPal, and then it goes to his PayPal account. Actually, as it turns out, uh, Vladimir, who developed, I hope I pronounced his name right, Adblock Plus, is so cool, he actually donates all his money back to the Mozilla Foundation. So that's a pretty cool way. But this just goes straight through PayPal. PayPal's simple, it's international. I hear conference organizers absolutely love it. Um, <laughs> and Yeah, all right. PayPal has its problems. Um, but still. We've done this, and we've done this for quite a long time, and we haven't had any issues. 
But the amount of money going through this is somewhere in the order of $500 to $1,000 a day. Now, when we are going for the phone, we're looking at millions of dollars a day going through the marketplace. So we had to be a little bit more paranoid than we started off. And we have this extra step, which is essentially pre-authorization. So once you've set up all your accounts, I didn't show that in the video because that's very boring and it's lots of typing and stuff. Once you've actually set up your account, you're then essentially pre-authorized and you can repeat your payment again without having to set up your accounts. All you have to enter is a PIN. Um, and then it's going to appear on and do carry billing. And the problem with that system is that all these payment systems basically rely on a token. You don't actually store the credit card data, but you have a token that you then use with a payment provider and say, hey, this person's given me this token, I'm gonna give it back and repeat this payment or, or something. And when you've got the token on your server, you will also have the credentials on your server. So you'll have a token that says, I can submit this payment, and you'll have these credentials that says, I'm authorized to submit this payment. And all of a sudden, it's like, hey, I'm a big target, come and hack me. Because as soon as Mozilla gets hacked, or something goes wrong, if you have those tokens and those credentials, you have the ability to run through a whole pile of fraudulent payments. And that would suck. So we started thinking about all the vulnerabilities that we had. Um, I'll go through the long list here, but the first one is kind of uh, a, a simple one, um, XSS. So um, we're all Django developers, we're all aware of XSS. Django is very good at escaping everything by default. That means we're completely invulnerable to XSS. No, we aren't. Um, there's going to be an XSS somewhere. We get one, uh, we, we've got rid of most of them, but we've, we've recently switched to a whole new front end, which uses JavaScript, and we found a whole new pile of XSS issues in there as well. Um, actually, we have probably the best, <coughs> sorry, the best QA team in the world at Mozilla, and one of the ladies who runs our QA team, whenever she sees a form, she always enters a script tag, so her name is script tag alert Krupa. And she puts this on everything. And uh, Mozilla has these big screens with, with Twitter feeds that show Twitter feeds. And we tweeted something that she did, and she XSSed the Twitter screen on the big screens at Mozilla because it was from the. So our, our app was fine, but then the other apps which pulled from it just blew up. So that's pretty cool. So good tip for testing always put script in your username. And one of, one of my other colleagues always puts strange Unicode. Yeah, there you go. So to prevent against XSS, uh, Firefox OS uses uh, something called Content Security Policy, or CSP, which is available in Firefox. Uh, and I think it's also landed in WebKit. And what it does, it allows you to whitelist where you are going to execute JavaScript from. So if you're being XSS, normally that means someone's just inserted some JavaScript into your document. Um, this prevents that by not executing any, any JavaScript inside the body. It only allows you to do that if you've whitelisted it or it's linked to from another pet place. Oh, this is really... My microphone's going in and out, sorry. I highly recommend it. Uh, the docs are there on MDN. And also GitHub recently implemented CSP. Should I use that? Hello. Alrighty. Sorry, I, I'm one of those people who talks with my hands, so it's always very hard to hold a microphone. So that's XSS pretty much taken care of. Um, the next major vulnerability we're going to face is phishing. Um, so Firefox has introduced a thing called uh, navigator.mozpay. And this is a API in a platform that you can call, which is designed to be a standard way of having a, doing a payment in your browser. So the goal is that we're sending MozPay to W3C to be certified. Um, we'll obviously remove the prefix Moz. Hopefully one day we'll have something called navigator.pay. There are, of course, a few of the people interested in this sort of approach. So it's going to a standards committee. We're on the standards committee, but it's a standards committee, so let's wait 20 years and then we'll have a standard. Um, so there are other te techniques called uh, PaySwarm and a few other people who come up with competing ideas. 
it'll all get sorted out. But navigator.mozpay allows you to um, start a payment process in this thing called a trusted UI. And the hope is that this trusted UI will prevent most of the common phishing attacks. I have to confess, I'm not exactly sure how it's doing that, so I'll skip to the next slide. Um, the security team tell me it's a great idea. We love our security team. Alrighty, so what are the next major attacks we're going to face? Well, they're, they're the big ones. They're SQL injection, remote execution, and of course, the biggest problem we face is ourselves. So, so far, Mozilla has had one big data breach, and that was when somebody copied a, the database to someone else, but did it through a public server and left a copy of a database somewhere. Bad move, especially when somebody found it on the bug bounty, and then we had to pay them. To... So, um, defending against ourselves is probably the thing we are most paranoid about. Um, so, what we have is a production site that contains a pile of data. It contains app data, it contains user data, and it contains these horrible tokens. Um, and what we do every week or so, or every month more like, is copy that database down to a development server so that as developers we can run queries and see how fast it's going and so on and so forth. Um, of course, what you need to do then is anonymize certain parts of that database to make sure that they never get copied from production. So we anonymize user data, and then we have to delete all the tokens. So we have a big script that goes through and, and chops all these parts of the database apart. But the real problem there is we, we feel that we've got one database, but you have multiple data policies about the data that's inside that database. Some parts that you can look at, some parts you can't. And we are an open source product, so everything is in GitHub. So all you need to do is A, someone forgets to anonymize the data, and then B, somebody gets a, commit, a, a, a git commit into our repository to do a SQL injection and we're toast. Now, you'd think this is really hard to do until there was that Rails vulnerability in GitHub which allowed you to do a mass assignment and assign everyone to be a committer on your repo. And then we had, oh my god, and we stopped, and we went through and reviewed every commit that we made in the last few weeks. So these sort of things happen. Um, so at that point, we decided, right, we're going to take this and we're going to split the site up into um, multiple Django sites. So um, we started a project called Solitude, and I would highly recommend when you start to name a project, go to Google and type name of project and then beer. Because it turns out Solitude's a very, very nice beer that I'd highly recommend. And um, I've got a cool t-shirt as well. And so every time we have a meeting, we have some beer with us as well. Uh, it's pretty good. The other thing apparently to do is to, like name a project conference as well. Works for Tarek, but there you go. So Solitude's a really good beer. We've started a, uh, a project on that. It's basically a REST API to the payment provider. Um, it's secure storage. Uh, it has a different data policy from the rest of our site. It allows us to reuse the payment system within Mozilla without having to put everything in, in one big site. Um, it's written using Django and TastyPie. And if you, I'm not trying to be negative, but if you read my tweets, you'll find out that I'm soon taking TastyPie out because it annoys me. Um, and we'll go with something else. We haven't decided what the something else is yet, but. Uh, we'll let you know. Obviously, inside the database, um, everything, the database itself is encrypted, the file system is encrypted, the uh, logs all get something special done to. But inside the database, we have went through and said, right, so these fields need to be encrypted, these fields need to be hashed. And then we also went through and said, how long are we going to retain all this data for? Because we don't want to keep everything around forever. Once the transaction is completed, we just need to know a certain few transaction details, and the rest we can throw away. We encrypted uh, our fields, something called uh, using Django AES field, which is just a simple little product I wrote based on a few Git gists I saw on GitHub. Um, the keys for it are not stored on the DB server, they're stored somewhere else, just in case our DB server gets hacked. So we've got a whole pile of stuff that's encrypted in the database. So here is our old system. This was it's not one box. We have 20 different web heads, and the database is on a different box. But essentially here, the problem is we have a marketplace. If the marketplace gets hacked. You will be able to get very quickly the credentials and all the tokens, and I get fired. So we went for the, this plan, which was we have this server called Solitude, which is our REST API. The marketplace talks to that, and Solitude has a database and the credentials. 
So in this scenario, a SQL injection of a marketplace will not actually get you very much at all. All it will get you is data that we consider a privacy violation. So um, you will know if you SQL inject the marketplace who has bought what, which is, uh, uh, from privacy terms is pretty bad. But from terms of people losing money, it won't happen. So that's pretty good. If you get into solitude, you will be able to figure out some way to do refunds or um, you know, process payments, divert money to yourself, that sort of thing. So this was pretty cool. And then our security team looked at it and went and said, hey, you know what would be really cool is move solitude into two parts. So now the marketplace talks to solitude. Solitude has a database of all the stuff. It then talks to a proxy. The proxy inserts the credentials, and that then talks to the payment provider. So at this point, we have um, the blue lines represent sort of boxes from a logical sort of point of view. So we have four different servers, three different servers that you have to try and get into to get a certain amount of information. Um, and what this means is there's some really awesome code that means we have a JSON request going from the marketplace to Solitude. We then ha make a SOAP request because our payment provider uses SOAP, yay. So a pile of XML that goes to the proxy. Uh, in the proxy, then I use LXML to pass the XML, insert the, the credentials, reconstitute the XML, and then send it onto the server, and then it comes all the way back. Um, yeah, don't ask me how this is going to scale yet, because you know, you've got four blocking HTTP requests here, at least. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just to make it even more complicated, we actually split the actual part of the code that processes the payments out into a separate project called WebPay. So we have yet another box, which is where the payment actually starts. And the other reason we did this is that we, we are trying to make Navigator MozPay a standard way for processing payments. And WebPay has almost no dependencies. It's just a very straightforward Django project. But hopefully, other people can use to implement payment systems when they want to do MozPay. It will have to talk to a bunch of different servers but how you implement those services is up to you. And there are already at least uh, two competing marketplaces that I know of for Firefox OS um, that people are trying to build and accept payments. And at least one of them is using Moz, Navigator MozPay. So um, we have competition. <laughs> Alrighty. So essentially, this is defense by depth. And as I went back to the thing, it really, we are just hedging against our own stupidity because the people who are most likely to make a mess of this is us. I know I'm inspiring confidence in you here. Um, believe me, it's really good. But we are just hedging against someone making a mistake. And it's, it's one of those things where it's not necessarily you making a mistake, but you've got to think about the programmers that are going to come after you. Making the assumption that the people who come after you know where you live. And when they come after you and they do something and it leaks all this data, they're going to come and hunt you down. And I'd rather not be hunted down. So to access Solitude, uh, we do it via requests. Um, it requires OAuth 1. It has very little network access. Um, even I don't have access to most of the boxes. I have access to DevBox, but nothing after that. Uh, so I was asking a pile of people, right, how do I write an API to talk to a REST API? And everyone kept saying, just use requests. And I'm like, man, do I really want to write code like this? Because in, in this scenario, I've put all my logic about how I'm accessing this server in a URL. And then I'm doing all this uh, error checking. And the error checking is knowing about the HTTP protocol and all the things that could go wrong. To me, that seems pretty sucky, because you don't write all your code um, in Django assuming you know, checking for particular database errors or database being offline. Those are things that are handled elsewhere or will come back, bubble up as suitable exceptions. So I wrote a wrapper around a project called Slumber. Uh, which is a nice little way of accessing REST, HTTP, REST APIs. Uh, I call mine curling um, because I'm Canadian. People know what curling is, right? Yeah, there you go. So um, yeah, you can tell by my accent I'm Canadian, I know. So curling um, allows you to do, it's a little wrap around slumber. Um, it inserts OAuth. It has a few convenience methods. So you'll notice here that if I can't find this object, it raises an object not found as opposed to a 404. This is a much nicer way to write code. And most importantly for us, it inserts metrics into every call. So we use Django stats D, and that will give us a nice little graph here. Um, this graph's not very useful because we haven't hit this API much yet. But this shows me how long each request was in our system. So we can find out slow APIs and, and so on and so forth. 
Um, and oh yeah, if you are doing anything, make sure you validate your um, SSL certs. Don't use URL lib and those things. Use requests and make sure you say verify equals true. That was a bug bounty that someone found. Um, one thing that I would recommend is OWASP is a security group um, who are trying to advocate better security practices. And they have a list of detection points that they consider the most likely ways for your app to be hacked. Now, if you go and read this list here, there are some very, very strange things in there. For example, if your application is accessed in the wrong order. And at first read, we went through and went, that doesn't make any sense. It's HTTP. People will access it however the hell they want. Um, but as it turns out, that there's quite a few things in here that are quite good things to look at. So we went through this and said, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a bad idea. So we started a project called Django Paranoia. And the basic goal of Django Paranoia is that we allow the, all the actions to go through, but we tell security when it happens. Um, so we don't actually block anything, although that might change if, if we find particular things that are bad. One of the things that, at Mozilla is because we are not the end payment provider, we're using another payment provider, we are not actually responsible for fraud. But we don't want to be in a situation where somebody gets into trouble. So we do our best to tell the security team, hey, this has happened, this is bad. Um, go and have a look at this transaction. So what are some examples? So we try, we try and spot these attempts and log them security. We have this thing called CEF, which actually Tarek wrote the library for, which allows us to log to this thing called CSF, and it goes to this application called ArcSight, which is a big, horrible, visual basic style application, and it has all these fields and stuff. But security love it, so that's cool. Um, and basically, we log every single request. And then we log particular points that we think are bad. So we have a thing called a paranoid form. And this form will do a few things that the standard Django form doesn't. So when uh, somebody submits a form with more key values than your form expects, it will write a log. So if someone tries to send an extra field, SQL equals uh, little bobby tables, it will send a log. Now, obviously, we catch this because when the, the form just ignores all that, it doesn't accept everything by default. But we need to make sure that we, we log that, because that's, that's, a, that's a sign that someone's trying to do something bad. And of course, if a form has less keys or values than required, it will log as well. And if your form post contains 4,000 backspaces, we will log that, because that's likely a bad submission. And we, I had a bit of a chat to security. So it's like, if someone sends me a form post with 4,000 backspaces, I send you a log of that. Your log system doesn't delete back 4,000? He said, no, but it used to. <laughs> so. uh, we have a Django Paranoid session, which is a wrapper around Django uh, cache. And this basically will log when your user agent changes. Because you've got a five minute session on the phone to make a payment. Hopefully your user agent does not change in those five minutes. If it does change from Firefox OS phone woo, to IE, perhaps something's gone amiss. Um, so we probably shouldn't allow that. If your IP address changes during the session, we log that as well. Now, this is an interesting one because it's perfectly valid for your IP address to change. If you're on a 3G connection, for example, and you move between towers, your IP address may change. It may not. It may change. If you switch between Wi-Fi and 3G, it definitely will change. So we, we do log this one. And security are writing a program that will take those changes and then do a geo lookup on your IP address and see if that change was a problem. So you start a session, so your IP address is in Poland, and then your session continues from China, you have a problem. So that, that, that's what we're logging and trying to come up with these different scenarios where things go wrong. So the two things I didn't do were XSS and SQL. These are recommended to look at. But I still don't know how I'm going to sanely detect this SQL injection here. Um, it's not as simple as just looking for single quotes. Um, I, I honestly looked at it and went, A, I don't know reliably how to detect this stuff, and B, if I did do it, is then someone going to start saying, ooh, hey, I just use raw SQL and put everything in 
into SQL, and it's okay because I use Django Paranoia to tell me when it's a SQL injection. It's like, no, I don't want that to happen. So um, at this point, I, I don't do that. So from all this, we've got a whole pile of triggers using Django Stats D and these security things. And so we can detect now things, for example, when refunds go over 50% of normal in Poland, perhaps something has gone wrong. So that's sort of how we're trying to hedge against uh, fraud happening um, within the marketplace. Um, just a few other notes on this. Um, Django has a built-in thing called uh, sensitive parameters, which allows you to decorate methods and various parts of your code to say, this piece of information in this code is sensitive. It should not go to logs or sentry. So we use logs and sentry to, to test stuff, and it's really embarrassing when you see like pin, blah, 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 in, the in your logs. Um, shouldn't do that. So I uh, fully recommend using that. So where are we now? So as it turns out, shipping version one of a phone is hard. Um, it's taken a lot longer than we'd planned. So actually in my talk, I said, oh, I'll be able to talk about um, uh, I-18N, and I'll be able to talk about scale and all these sorts of things. And I've talked about those in the past, but the problem is we haven't actually shipped the phone. So we haven't got to the real hard part, which is actually scaling all this yet. So we have an SLA, which currently, uh, we're still debating on, but the service level agreement we'll have is somewhere around five nines of uptime. And we're like, you know, you do remember that every nine you add on the end means like a 10 times increase in cost, right? And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, it's going to be up 99.99% of the time, and it has to be fast in all the countries we're shipping phones in, um, none of which are the US, which is where we all are, or Canada. So um, we, we do have a big scale problem. Um, we will hit this really soon. Um, and that's something we're going to have to solve. Um, so we will ship a phone soon, honest. Um, it's going to be a real phone, and we are going to have to face real scaling problems soon. So that's going to have to be something I'm going to have to come back and talk about at another conference. Um, we are actually having a Firefox OS workshop in Poland, uh, right here in Warsaw on Saturday, uh, June 1st. So please come and sign up. And you can learn how to make Firefox OS's uh, apps. Uh, I don't know if we're giving them out again, but last time we did one of these, we gave out phones to a lot of people. I, I, everyone's going to hate me now because they're going to go and don't get a phone. And all you, you'll, go, you'll go there and all you get is a lousy T-shirt or something. Um, but there's a link on my presentation here. So go sign up and uh, go and write some Firefox OS apps. And that is it. <laughs>